Today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 364, join Big Al talk covered call investing strategies, as well as preferred stocks, calculating interest on Series I bonds, required minimum distributions from your retirement accounts and when they must begin, using your retirement savings at age 72 to buy a home, calculating your highest possible Social Security benefit and how it may be taxed. We'll also hear some listener comments about YMYW and my record collection. Your money questions and comments are what make this show a show. So visit yourmoneyyourwealth.com and click Ask Joanne Al on air to send them to the fellas as an email or a priority voice message. We take those first so Joe doesn't have to read them. So we'll kick things off today with one we got from Michael. I'm producer Andy Last with the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson CFP and Big Al Clopine CPA. Good morning, Joe and Al. Very much appreciate your efforts and time to make the podcast. Enjoy listening to it. I have an interesting question. Do you and your portfolio strategies ever think of using covered call strategies uh, such as JEPI and QYLD? In a rising market, they obviously will not participate as much, but in a down market, they do have large dividend payments on the uh, options they write that will reduce the downside. Just curious, in this uh, environment where income is so hard to find, is it something that for a small percentage you might uh, want to include in your portfolios? Thanks, and keep up the good work. All right. Uh, good question. Great question, Michael. So hard, it's hard to find income right now with fixed income in instruments, isn't it? Yes. Well, I mean, it, it, it's improving a little bit, but not, not much. Not great. <laughs> so let's talk about what he's um, referring to. Um, there's new ETFs that are um, have a either a covered call strategy or they're, you know, writing or selling call options more or less. Right. And what that means is for most everyone else that has no idea what that. Yeah. You need to explain it is. to us. Uh, CPAs. And layman. So I was going to say, start with what's an ETF. <laughs> okay. Exchange traded all, fund. Okay, yeah. ETFs and exchange traded fund. Yeah. Okay, um, good start. Usually you would write a, um, a call strategy or, or an option strategy on individual securities. Now there's um, getting a little bit more robust and they're doing them um, inside a wrapper of an ETF. So you can almost have like a hedge fund type experience inside a wrapper of an exchange traded fund at a very low cost. Yeah. So what a, what a covered call is or, or what, a, what he's referring to is that they're selling call options. And what that means is this, is that let's say I have a stock and it's worth $100. And let's say that stock produces a 2% dividend. So I get $2 of dividends per year and the stock price is at hundred bucks. So what they're doing is that they're selling calls and they're saying, hey, you have the right to purchase this stock, let's say at $105. And I'm gonna charge you $2 for that option. So you pay me $2. So I get a $2 dividend plus a $2 premium from the option. So right off the bat, I just doubled my dividend yield, if you will. Got it. Does okay. that make sense? Yep. So if the market goes down, no big deal. I still get the, the dividend and the call option premium. Okay. So I still get my $4. The problem is, is that if it goes above 105, let's say the stock goes to $130. Well, I gave the right to you to buy it at 105. So I lost the total upside appreciation of that stock. So, I, so it hits 105 and I have to sell it to you. Correct. Or you have to sell it to me or however. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So you have the right to purchase that stock at $105, even though the, the stock shot up to 125 or 115 or 106 or whatever it is. Okay. Got it. Right. So I'm losing the forward appreciation of the overall stock. Right. Right. I'm locking in a price at a certain period of time and I'm not going to receive anything more than that if the stock overperforms whatever that option price is. Got it. But but I don't really have any downside, do I? I well, mean, sure. I mean, if the stock plummets, well, I mean, you, you still I, own oh, the yeah, stock. Oh, I still own the stock. I, that's right. I forgot about that piece. <laughs> right. But but what I think Michael is saying is that, hey, well, you can make up from some of the downside because of the large premiums that they're receiving from these options. Got it. Okay. So it's, a, it's an interesting strategy. So it's a way to create more income. You know, some of these products also uses leverage. So with leverage, you're leveraging the upside as well. So in this case, maybe I don't receive 4% or $4. I could receive eight. But now on the downside, 
that leverage is going to cut, you know, like, like a knife either way. Right. Sure. Um, so the downside, there is no downside protection. I'm locking in on the upside, but I'm receiving a premium for locking myself in the upside. Now you can do a put for the downside, right? Oh, although it's not. <laughs> He's just throwing out terms. Um, so I, I think if someone's looking for income, I think if someone understands options and the, you know, JEPI, what they do is they buy the S&P 500. What is interesting with QILD is that they're using like the NASDAQ 1000. So, the, you know, these tech companies never really issued dividends before. And, you know, they're growth stocks. They're not necessarily like, you know, the, the big, you know, the, the big stapled stocks that, you know, produce pretty large dividends. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, think it's, I think it's a viable strategy if you understand what you're doing. Um, are we putting these in our portfolios to our clients? Um, not at this point, but I mean, you know, when markets are volatile or when interest rates are low, there's always different kind of, you know, mechanisms that Wall Street will put out. You know, and say, hey, you could get a lot higher yield, or here's a here's a good way to get some income. So, it th th there's risk on, on not necessarily getting the full appreciation. You have no downside protection again, um, so you're limiting the upside with the full downside. So, got it. You know, to, to get a little more income. Correct. Got so it. you just kind of want to take a look at what you're doing there, but depends on the premium. So the premiums in Michael's case is saying, well, that's going to protect you a little bit on the downside because you're getting additional yield um, by the option. So got it. Okay. All right. Is there a particular know. type of type of investor or a particular you know age of investor or something like that that this would be more appropriate for than others? Well, yeah, I, I think someone that's looking for income would want to use utilize this strategy. You know, if, if you're younger, if you want the full growth of the market, you would never want to do this because you're just capping your upside. You know what I mean? So it's like if, if I have a stock at $100, it went to $200 a share, but I sold it at 105 So I lost all that upward moment of the overall appreciation of the stock. And so if you're going to hold the stock for a long period of time, if you're really looking for growth, not necessarily income, you wouldn't do this. Yep. If you're looking for a little bit more income, you know, this will give you some definitely more income than let's say, you know, a CD, sure. uh, but it's a stock and it's an option strategy. So there's still downside risk. Yeah. There's still a ton of risk in this. You can lose your principal. Well, you can lose everything. You can lose hundred percent of it to get right. a little added yield. Sure. But a lot of these, you know, option strategies, like I said, they're, they're, they're writing options on a lot larger companies. This QILD is a little bit more interesting just because, you know, it's the NASDAQ. It's the triple Qs. Yeah. So it's not just one company. It's a collection of lots of companies. Correct. So you're diversified in that case. And then now there's different ways on how they wrapper the, the option. It gets a little bit more complex than that, but um, hopefully that helps. We got Mike from Chicago and he goes, dear Joe. Now my birthday is 1950. When do I need to start my RMD? Was that, was that? Um, yeah. When do I need to start my RMD? Got it. Uh, you have to start it. Uh, this is, this is the year you turn 72. So you've got to do it by April 1st of 2023. But if you wait all the way till then, you have to have two RMDs for 2023. Oh, I thought that was like a follow-up question from someone else. <laughs> My birthday is July 1950. How old is he? It's well, 2022. Uh, so. It'll be 72 this year. In July. July. Yep. Yeah. Got it. So he's got to take his RMD yes. by the end of next year. And if he does take but, it by the end of next year, he has to take two. I thought that was April 1st of the following year, his first one. And otherwise, he has to take two. Correct. Yep. Your required beginning date mm -hmm. is April 1st. The following year, you turn 72. But if you don't take your RMD this year, you got to take two of them next year. Next year. Yep. So it gives you a little um, security blanket. A little yeah, because some people don't realize they have to do an RMD. And, and you know what? If you don't take an RMD, required minimum distribution when you're supposed to, guess what the penalty is? 50%. Half. 50. Half, right? So there you go. You're pretty close to that age. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I am closer than you, though. Yeah, boy. Okay, we got Gus uh, writes in from Philadelphia. Hey, Joe and Al, great show. Been listening for about two years. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, my dad is 92 years young and has been taking RMDs as required. Um, he doesn't need the money, so he transferred his investments in kind from his IRA to his brokerage account. One question is, given that the transfers 
are in kind, when is the best time of year to make the transfer? His vehicle of choice over the years has been preferred stocks as he enjoys the dividends, as well as um, as well as the guarded type minimum twenty five redemption value. Okay, he only okay he he only invests in blue chip uh, preferreds with little risk of bankruptcy. Happy holidays! Thanks for the spitballs, Gus from Philly. Okay, so a required minimum distribution is that by law from a retirement account, you are required to take money out of the account and pay the tax. So let's assume that Gus's father, that is 92 years young, has a million dollars in his retirement account and his required distribution is $40,000. Sure. So he needs to pull $40,000 out of his account that year to satisfy the required distribution. Yeah, it could be from January 1st to December 31st. Doesn't really matter when. And the reason why is that the, the IRS wants to get their tax money in that next t- tax year. So the, the reason why it's the following year is they take your balance of your IRA at December 31st of the year before they figure out how much required minimum distribution you need to make. And you just have to take that out between January 1st, December 31st. So they want to deplete the overall account over time. At 92, his RMD is probably not 4% on a million dollars. No, it's, it's probably it's closer to eight, eight or 10, maybe. I don't know. It's even maybe higher than that. I got the table, but I'm not going to look it up and do his RMD. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, so that 40,000 is 100% taxable. And so let's yeah. just assume he's in. And it's ordinary income. Right. So let's say he owes $10,000 in tax. Um, you could either withhold the tax from the distribution and pay the IRS right there. Yeah. Or you could pay the tax out of outside money, whatever you want to do that $40,000 of the RMD is going to be hundred percent ordinary income tax. Sure. Taxable. Right. So what Gus's father's doing is that he's not taking the distribution in cash. He's not saying, Hey, sell XYZ stock and give me $40,000 in cash and I'll just pay the tax or I'll withhold the tax. He has blue chip stocks and preferred right. stocks. Sure. And he's saying, you know what? I want to transfer $40,000 of shares okay. yeah. of XYZ stock and just give me the stock and put it in the brokerage account. Yeah, which you can do. Which is great. It's a good strategy. Right. He has to pay the tax still. Sure. Right. And so when he does his taxes or he does estimates or whatever the case may be, um, he pays the tax, but he's just taking the stock out of the retirement account in kind and now putting it into a brokerage account. Right. So he's wondering, what is the timing? What's yeah. the best timing on this? Beginning, middle, end? I don't, I mean, that's a, t- that's a market timing question well, in a sense, because let's say if the stock goes down, right. you could get a lot more shares out. If you wait until the stock is down and you probably want to do that. So you get as many shares out of the retirement account with the least amount of tax possible. Yeah. That's the best answer. If you've got a great crystal ball. Yeah. But no one has a crystal ball. (laughs) So I mean, maybe another way to think about it is if you do it earlier in the year, the dividends on those shares will, will be currently taxable, but at least they'll probably be taxed at the capital gains rate because most of them would be qualified dividends, if not all. Right. Whereas if you left it in the IRA, you just have dividends in an IRA, you'd have, have higher ordinary income later. So maybe that's the way to think so, about th- it. Yeah. Then I, I guess to, to piggyback on that is, does he need the income? So if he's taking, let's say the $40,000 out, he takes that out in January, it's going to pay the dividends over time, but it's going to be taxed at capital gains. But if he doesn't need the income, he's paying tax on income that he doesn't need. Well, that's true too. Then in that case, you won't you wait till the end Th- of the Then year. you wait until December. <laughs> yeah, right. So <laughs> it depends, I guess. So, all right, good question. How much money do you need in retirement and how does your retirement account balance stack up right now? What's your contribution rate? How much of your portfolio should be in cash? Are your assets properly allocated? Learn how to answer these questions and how to manage your assets at any age with our portfolio tracker guide available for free from the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app to go to the show notes, read the transcript of today's episode, ask Joe and Al your money questions, and download the portfolio tracker guide for free. Then click share and spread the word about YMYW. We got a question? Yeah, we do. We do. We got, we, we got one from Chris. Okay. Um, he writes in, he goes, I want to take money out of my IRA 401k to buy a home. I'm retired in 72 and a half. Um, what would I have to pay based on my income is only social security. I have about $300,000 in the 401k. All right. So 
I'm really glad that Chris wrote in um, because he wants to purchase a a house and he's like, Hey, I got 300 grand in the old 401k. Yeah. How much can I get out? What's it going to cost? I'm 72 and a half. I don't know why he's sharing the half. Well, (laughs) it happens to be the RMD age, which is not irrelevant. Is it 72 and a half or 72? Well, I think it's, oh, yeah. it's probably a combination. It used to be seven and a half. So he's thinking of both. Even threw me off. All right. I mean, who, the, the whole IRS is stupid. But not, <laughs> that 59 and a half, 70 and a half. Well, I mean, yeah. And then they come up with these, these numbers, 19,974. It's like, why not just 20,000? Right. Yeah. Come on. Um, yeah. So, all right. So, Chris, because you're over, the, he's a, eligible for required minimum distributions yes and so i don't know if he's asking us if he gets special treatment because he's 72 and a half from a tax perspective the answer is no um also people say all right well my only income is social security you know my tax bracket i I, I pay very little in tax why don't i pull the money out of the retirement account because i'll pay very little in tax right and but the tricky thing is when you have extra income then your social security income suddenly becomes taxable so that that's what makes this tricky well even no but what he doesn't realize is that a hundred percent of the money that he pulls out of the retirement account is going to be taxed as ordinary income correct so it doesn't matter what tax bracket he's in if he pulls three hundred thousand dollars out, he's going to put himself in a high tax bracket. Correct. And he's going to take that money, Alan, and he's going to purchase a home, and then he's going to get a tax bill next April of a hundred thousand dollars. Yes, I agree with that. Right. Yep. And so, what's Chris going to have to do to come up with a hundred grand? Well, he's um, he's got to go back to the. IRA, 401k, if there's anything, but if there's nothing, he's going to have to borrow. Right. So, so here we've seen this multiple, multiple times and I, I don't, I'm, I'm not uh, poking the bear here. I just want to educate Chris that okay. this could be one of the biggest mistakes that he ever makes in his life in regards to finance. Yeah. Is that let's assume that he takes $300,000 out and purchases a home. He's like, you know what? I'm retired. I have my social security income. I don't necessarily need this 300,000. I'm renting. I want a, 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 you know, a place to call my own. Right. So he takes the 300 grand out, buys a home, pays all cash. Right. Feels pretty good. Sure. No mortgage. No mortgage. Right. He's got a nice little place. Next April, he's going to get a tax bill because that $300,000 is all tax at ordinary income. And I don't know if um, Chris is single or married. But let's assume he's single and at $300,000 of income, he's at the 35% tax bracket. So, you know, you could take 30% roughly of 300,000 is 90 grand. So, and then depending on what state he lives in, he's going to have to pay state tax. So let's just assume he pays $100,000 in tax. That's the tax bill that he has next year. But where's Chris going to come up with the cash to pay the hundred grand? Unless he has other resources. He, right? l- let's say he blew his lob, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And so then he, he's like, what do I do now? Right. Well, then you have to borrow. Yeah. Then you got to go and take a <laughs> loan. And your whole purpose of doing this was to be debt free and have a nice house and everything else. Now you're going to have to get a loan of a hundred thousand dollars to pay the IRS. But guess what? You don't have income. You have social security income. Are you going to qualify for the loan? You don't have any other assets because you took the assets out to purchase the house. Yeah. I'm going to answer the question a little bit different. I'm going to say, I'm going to pretend he asked and maybe did ask for the down payment. Like how much could he take out for a down payment? What would that be taxed at? And the answer to that question, because you only have social security and assuming you're married, you could pull out $25,000 and pay no tax whatsoever because that's roughly the amount of the standard deduction. If you're single, it's half of that. If you, pay, if you pull out any more than that, you're going to start running into where Social Security becomes partially taxable. So it's, it, it's a little bit tricky. You could pull out roughly 100, if you're married, roughly 100,000 and, and keep in the lowest bracket. Not quite because more of your social security would be taxable. You got to do that calculation. If you're asking it that way for a down payment, then you kind of, we need a little bit more information, you know, on your social security, whether you're married, whether you're single to tell you how much tax it would be. Right. It's going to be more than you think. 
that's true. And, and even if we're talking about the down payment, it's going to be more than you think, because by pulling money out adds income, which will make your social security, which is previously tax free, will become 50 or 85% of that amount taxable. Right. You, I can't tell you how many times people made this mistake is that they have a lot of money in a retirement account. They look at the balance, they find their dream home, or they're looking at a retirement home, a second home or whatever, and they're taking retirement dollars and buying homes sure. and not have a clue of the tax impact, or they're paying off a large more mortgage. You know, let's say he, instead of buying a home, he's got a $300,000 mortgage. He's going to pull the $300,000 out of the retirement account to pay off the $300,000 mortgage. Okay, that's great. You're debt free for how long? <laughs> <laughs> Not that long because now next April, you're going to owe $90,000, $100,000 in tax. And guess what? You're going back to refinance the house that you just paid off to pay the tax. Correct. So that's why, I mean, we're such big components of tax diversification, understanding the taxation of each of the different accounts. That's why I'm a huge proponent of Roth IRAs because you take the uncertainty of taxes in stupid mistakes that we all make with our money out of the out the window, right? Take it out of the Roth. Guess what? You're going to blow up your overall retirement, but you're not going to blow it up that bad because there would be no tax. Uh, Ed Wrighton from Illinois. He goes, hey, I drive a 2010 Honda Accord. Very nice. Don't really see a lot of Honda Accords on them. Not as many as used to, it used I mean, to be every, the every, main car, right? right? For a long time. Like every third car is a Honda Accord. <laughs> I had a hundred cord in college. Did you? This they sir. last forever, right? Yeah. They, they don't break down that much. Um, thou, I am thinking of. <laughs> I think that's no. <laughs> thou. Um, where art thou? Um, I'm, right. I'm thinking of buying a Highlander hybrid. All right. Okay. I, listen, I listen to the podcast while exercising. Love the show. Okay. I'm 70 plus and retired. All right. I bought treasury I bonds for my wife and I. Good idea. Of course you did, Ed. Um, how is the interest rate calculated and when does it change? So, um, I bonds, a couple of things. You can only buy about $15,000 per year on I bonds. So yeah, I, I think it's, uh, right. And I think it's 25,000 per couple. So it's not like you're, you know, putting a ton of, I mean, oh, right. I, I don't want to, you know, say 15,000 is not a ton of money, sure. um, but it's not, hopefully it's not Ed's entire portfolio. It may not be a life changer. It, let's it put, might not. Let's put, let's put it that way. Right. And may, then, maybe for some people. Yeah. Interest rates are calculated roughly every six months, I believe. And it's on based on the CPI index. So why do you think Ed bought I bonds? Because the interest rate right now is about 7%. Right, because of the CPI, right? Inflation is, is, I mean, we're feeling it. And it's like, okay, well, you know, let's, let's purchase these things. Yeah, so, but it, it's not fixed. It changes about every six months. Correct. Um, and it's zero coupon, uh, I believe. So what that means is that it's, you know, you buy it at a certain price and then the interest rate is embedded um, within it. You can, uh, it's tax-free, I believe, if you use it for education purposes. It is. I, th I thought they made your, the payments, but I could the, the, You know, I don't know. I've never bought an iPhone. I'm just making this up as we go. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that... Like double E bonds back in the day and, you know, the H bonds and all that stuff, we would have clients come in and then they would have a suitcase full of these things. <laughs> it's like, what the hell do you want me to do with this? And you go down right. to the treasury direct and then you got to put in the well, serial numbers. I know because, because some had payment coupons and some were zero coupon bonds. And, and I mean, and they had millions of them. And, and some people were, were the zero coupon bonds. They were reflecting the interest payments on their return, even though they didn't receive them. Some people had no idea they were supposed to do that. Yeah. It's, it's complicated. Yeah. I mean, and then they would have the physical coupons, you know, right. the, the, the physical bonds. Yeah. What do we do with these? I don't know. Just, just <laughs> go to another advisor. Yeah, I think also, Joe, with I bonds, um, I was reading. Oh, well, you were. Yeah, Edu I was ed you know, ed educating, educating myself. Yeah. I got it. Right. Is if you if you cash out of them within a year, you lose all, all the, the interest, interest for the oh. year. And if you cash out within five years, I think you just lose the last quarter interest. Okay. I think that's how that works. All righty. Very good. Um, thanks for the. Thanks for the question, Ed. Uh, <laughs> just warming up my uh, throat here, big Al. <laughs> Got it. I like the way you sing into it. Uh. Yeah, just get warmed up. Um, this is, what do we got here? Uh, Dr. Rosen, Rosen, Rosen. Rosen, Rosen. Oh, I know Dr. Rosen, Rosen. Whoa. So from Fletch? Yep. Uh, Rosen, Rosen? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, lives in Florida. 
Um, how about the movie um, uh, Doctor? 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 Doctor. Yeah, I do. Uh, Which one was that? Spies Like Us. Yeah. Uh, that's Chevy Chase as well. I remember that. Um, hi, Joe. Alan, Andy. I'm four years from retirement and 12 years from Social Security. During the eight years in between, I plan on filling up the 15% tax bracket with Roth conversions as I'll have no income. Uh, most of my retirement is already Roth. My goal is to have 100% of my retirement in Roth by the time I start taking Social Security. Two questions, please. Uh, is there any reason it'd be unwise to convert 100%? I think I, ha- I had heard about medical deductions being a reason to keep the pre-tax. And then uh, the second one is once I start taking Social Security, the SSA indicates that income of 32 to 44 requires a tax of 50% of Social Security benefits in more than 44K creates an 85% tax on Social Security benefits. My wife and I will be receiving about $44,000 in Social Security benefits. Is that included in the calculation? In other words, right out the gate, is my Social Security to be taxed 85% if I have no other earned income than the $44,000 of Social Security, I assume the Social Security income doesn't count towards that calculation, but cannot find the answer. I understand pre-tax distributions do count and post-tax distributions do not count for the calculations. Thanks for your time. All the best. Dr. Rosen Rosen. Um, love the Fletch references. <laughs> That's good. And wow. you got you got pretty loud that segment. You got uh, because animated. Dr. Rosen Rosen got me all fired <laughs> up about Fletch. <laughs> Um, yeah, so hold on. Couple, so a few things here. Um, you're, you're thinking provisional income, uh, provisional income will use half of your social security benefits. And then, um, your adjusted gross income on top of that, uh, to come up with your provisional income to determine how much of your social security benefits are going to be subject to tax. It's not a 50% tax or an 85% tax. It's just 50% of the benefits would be then subject to income tax or 85% of those benefits are going to be subject to income tax. Say it another way is that 50% of the benefits would be tax-free or 15% of the benefits would be tax-free. See, half half empty, half full. Do do it the other way. Sure. All right. So yeah, so provisional income, it's, yeah, it's all your income sources without regard to social security then you add back half of your social security. So in your case, if you only have social security, half of the 44,000 is 22,000, you're below the limit, you're not taxed on social security. And then if all of your money's in Roth IRA, um, then yeah, your social security is not taxed. Everything's tax-free. You're living the tax-free life. Yeah, you know, for me, I'd say do it if you can, if you do it in the low bracket. Now, if, if, you're, if you're trying to get an accountant's answer, since I'm, I'm a CPA, I will tell you this, since you get a standard deduction, Right. right. Of about $25,000. Right. So you don't necessarily have to convert everything, even if you have a small required minimum distribution, because it's probably going to be tax free anyway. Even if a little bit of your social security is considered taxable, once you subtract out the, the um, standard deduction, you, you're probably at zero tax anyway. Right. So if, if you want the, the real technical answer, you don't necessarily have to convert everything. But I'm not opposed to it because that gives you the most flexibility as long as you can do it in low brackets. You might be paying more tax if you could convert everything into a Roth. Yeah. Right. Potentially. That, I mean, that, that's that's the that's the downfall. That's the downfall, right? That you're all right. Well, but you the, the pro is you get the uncertainty of tax and you'll never pay taxes again. You're you're done, right? You're, you're all set. <laughs> I kind of it's like not having a mortgage. I've got no more taxes. Yeah. Dr. Rosen Rosen. I think I'm going to watch Fletch this weekend. I, I think that's the implication is that you need yeah. to. No. I think I will too. That's a good, no. good tip. Paging Dr. Rosen Rosen. When to take Social Security is one of the biggest retirement decisions you'll make. How to wring every possible cent out of the benefits you're entitled to receive and how your Social Security will be taxed are important things to know before you claim. Download the Social Security Handbook from the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com for free to continue your Social Security education. Now, you also need to coordinate when and how you claim your benefits with all the other aspects of your finances. If you do it wrong, it can be a really expensive and long-term mistake. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the show notes, download the Social Security Handbook, and then click Get an Assessment to schedule a comprehensive analysis of your entire financial plan, including Social Security. One of the experienced financial professionals on Joe and Big Al's team at Pure Financial Advisors will help you make the right choices before you claim your benefits. All right, we got Mark from Massachusetts. 
Um, hi, Big Al. And the other guy just phoning to let you know that I have a billion dollars in Roth IRA, a Jaguar, and a purebred miniature Dachshund. 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 Um, and my favorite drink is Glenn Levitt Winchester 50 year. Wow, that's pretty expensive. Uh, just joking with you, Joe. Sorry. Um, so I'm phoning in for a pretty general question. Okay. Um, I'm hoping you could help me out. I'm trying to figure out the break even best solution formula for whether or not my widowed father should be withdrawing from his or my mother's uh, pass away at 55, assuming equal income throughout the life as my father's $70,000 social security benefits. Okay, my father makes about $70,000 a year and he's 63. A uh, couple health concerns, not expecting to live beyond 75. He's got a good nest egg, but may like to keep working till 65 so he can add to his Roth IRA till and pass on some funds. Um, we're a little worried because his lower life expectancy that he will lose out on a lot of social security benefits. Given his total income and life expectancy, mathematically speaking, is in a kind of a vacuum would he make out better off? You following this, brother? I think so. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll answer it as I understand it. Got it. Um, I understand that Social Security will allow you to keep at least 15% of your benefits, even if you exceed taxable income thresholds. The grace income of $25,000 and 50% tax rate on income beyond this. How might this play out if he retires now and takes spousal benefits, then 65 takes his own or tax his own benefits? This might be a perfect example of someone with enough knowledge to screw something up, but not enough to do it right. Um, okay, Mark. I think in that last uh, sentence, he meant or take his own benefits. Since he's kind of blowing me up. Well, I think, I think, I, I think the question is dad is working making 70 grand a year. He's 63, but his life expectancy is shortened. Is he shortened. wants to work until 65. Right. And then he, but he's, he, but, but should he retire now? Start social security now. Right. And maybe he, maybe he makes out better. Even though he loses some social security benefits, which are tax favored down the road. But, but Mark's all over the place. I know. Okay. Yep. So Mark is saying, should he take the spousal benefit? First right. of all. Yeah, we well, can't do that. Okay. So the spouse died. His mother yeah. passed. Yeah. So there's no spousal benefit. There's a survivor benefit. Mm -hmm. So Mark's dad could take a survivor benefit as early as age 60. But if he's making $70,000 a year, they're going to reduce that benefit because he's taking it early. Right. He has to wait until full retirement age. Then he can take the social security amount, which um, his owner or, or the survivor benefit and the benefit will not be reduced. There's no 50% tax. 50% of the benefit is subject to income tax. And then when you breach another threshold, then an additional 25% is subject to income tax. So it's not a 50 or 75% tax on the money. It's just stating that 75% or 50% of the benefit is going to be subject to income tax, depending on what Mark's income tax or Mark's father's income tax bracket is. Right. So should he take the survivor benefit now at 63, if he's going to continue to work at 65 with him making $70,000 a year? There's two things here. I would say no, because he's making $70,000 a year. He wouldn't keep hardly any. Because if, if every, any. every $2 that he earns, they're going to take a buck back. Right. That's not a tax. That's basically saying you're taking your benefit early and you're still working. There's an income threshold for them for people, if they make more than, I forget what that is right now. I don't have that number in front of me, like $30,000. Um, Which number are you talking about? It's probably not in this. He's because he's looking at the tax threshold. Um, I'm looking at the social security clawback, um, which wouldn't be on this. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, it's, you're, you're talking about the 19,560. Oh yeah. 19,560. Mm -hmm. There you go. The estimated earnings exempt amount. Yeah. So that, that means if you make more than $20,000, every get, dollar, every $2 over that, they're going to take a dollar back of social security benefits. Yeah. So you're, you're 50,000 over in this example, right? So they, they take half of that 25,000 back, but you don't, you don't lose it. It's just like, you never got it. Right. So he's going to claim at age 63, right? But 
he made too much money. So yeah. he's he's going to receive that benefit this year. Right. But then next year, he's not going to receive a benefit. Yeah. Because they said, well, you made too much money. Yeah. Your social security benefit was 25000 You were over the threshold by that amount. We're going to take that back. Right. And so he now retired. He doesn't have the $70,000. He's waiting on that social security income, and it's not showing up. Uh, so that's an issue. Um, I would wait until I would tell your dad to retire. Yeah. If, if he's got impaired life expectancy and he wants to retire and he can go ahead. Right. I wouldn't worry about break even social security and all this stuff. Just, just enjoy take, life. Yeah. Take the survivor's benefit now. And, and yeah, you'll have, he'll have a reduced benefit later, but maybe it's less important if he's got a reduced life expectancy. We got a couple of comments. Cleveland Jake was like my favorite podcast. Which is his favorite podcast? I wonder. I need, some, I need some recommendations here. <laughs> kind of run as well. Um, and yeah, I am just as disappointed as Joe with that. Um, okay, I disagree with the ninja and the Joe haters. What the hell? Do I have Joe haters? Uh, well, well, ninja didn't like you. You know, I need to go pump sand. <laughs> Did you ever hear from him again? No, just um, that one. Time. Yeah, he's a big fan. He goes by Cleveland Jake now. <laughs> He's <laughs> trying to make amends. He meant to uh, challenge another show. Yeah, I love the playful banter. Inside of five years from retirement, I've learned a lot from this podcast. Love it. Uh, love you, Cleveland Jake. Uh, appreciate the nice words. Uh, Stephen? Yep. Or Stefan? Could be either, but Stephen is how we usually pronounce it in the U.S. If I had that um, spelling, it would definitely be Stefan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Love seeing your record collection and your background on the show. Oh, this one good. was sent directly to me. Yeah, so that's, and, that's and it does so say I'm, don't I'm, tell Joe and Al something, but I am contractually obligated to tell them everything that I'm emailed. So sorry, Stephen. So what? Are you talking smack here? Um, I think you should select an. Uh, so we're, I'm like I feel like I'm reading like a like a private email that <laughs> Stephen here sends yeah. to Andy. Right. It's like I'm like reading her diary or something. I'm feeling very uncomfortable about this. Okay, well, continue because our listeners want to know she, it. Well, she puts it on the, the sheet, so I just <laughs> I read. Um, I feel like Charles Barkley reading a teleprompter. <laughs> <laughs> you ever I, seen that one? No, yeah. but I've seen him play golf. and I know Well, he was like. reading a teleprompter, and they played a joke on him, and it said, I'm a jackass. Right and at and the end it. of it, and then yeah. he, you know, oh, all right, and I am a jackass. And then he, like, he <laughs> sat there and was like, oh my god, I just. Read that. <laughs> um, all right, so Stephen loved seeing your record collection when I came over last night. <laughs> nah, that's not what it said. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the background on the show, I think you should select an album displayed in the background for each show or segment. Uh, don't tell Joe and Al, but I think the show has really improved since you've joined. Well, this guy's been a long time listening. Then. I know it's part of the commercial relief of the show to have comical. Joe whatever <laughs> comical it looked like commercial to me i know it's part of the comical relief of the show to have joe read the questions but since he reads at about a third grade level i sometimes wish they would just let you read the questions keep up the good work thank That's you Stephen. Was sent directly to Andy. yeah and you know what i i agree with you <laughs> i don't get paid to read <laughs> pretty good at math all right uh, it does make it more fun though i don't know why I'm the one that's reading these. I don't know how that started. I don't remember either, but I enjoy it. It's super easy for me. Yeah. I just sit back and listen. Yeah, we, we, before I would have to read anything aloud. Okay, Stephen, why don't you come on the show and I'm going to give you some, some emails. Let's see how you do. <laughs> you do. I bet he'll kill it. <laughs> Probably, uh, and they will end up hiring him. Yes, take over for me. <laughs> um, please, we're taking applications. Uh, send in your applications. Uh, thank you all for the nice emails. Uh, thank you all for uh, making this show great um, by sending in your questions. So keep it up and uh, we'll keep reading them. Uh, show's called Your Money or Wealth. Energy drinks, dachshunds, Glenlivet, and phoning in the derails at the end of the episode, so stick around. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call us at 888-994-6257 and schedule a free financial assessment at a date and time convenient for you, no matter where you are in the country. Chances are one of the experienced financial professionals at Pure will be able to identify strategies to help you create a more 
more successful retirement. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Joey Anderson, Big Al Quilpine, hanging out and answering. Answering. answering, reading your question and trying to answer. Yeah, it's a little sip of uh, your energy drink. Yeah, it's a little syrupy. Is it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Aren't they always? Aren't you used to that by now? There's a, it's a sugar-free one, so you would think oh, it's okay. a little bit less huh. syrupy. But. I don't. I don't really. I drink coffee, but I don't really drink this. Yeah, we should. I suppose could, could that'd be per- really. I'd, you... I'd be just like you. Yeah, you, you would actually have a personality. It'd be great. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's uh, let's I, see what. I don't um, think I want to be like that. <laughs> let's see. I don't want you to be like that. The, the, the show would be awful. I mean, <laughs> more awful than it already is. Yeah, you're presuming some people like it. <laughs> exactly. Darkson, I was going to say something totally different. <laughs> a, like a douche hound. <laughs> well, it's, it, it, you could say dash hound. Dash hound. That's kind of what it looks like. Uh, Duxon. 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 Um, and my favorite drink is Glenn Levitt Winchester 50 year. Wow, that's pretty expensive. Look that up. See how much that is. Uh, just joking with you, Joe. Sorry. I had to do that to you. Because you're the other guy. Come on. See, if I'm like Zen with COVID. <laughs> it doesn't even bother doesn't you. Mean, yeah. Look at that. Um, I'm phony. I don't know. Because you always say if people call you, even if they don't. But do you say I'm phoning you or I'm calling you? Well, I think that's the joke, is that he knows that you always say, we've got so-and-so calling, so he's making the joke that he's phoning you, even though he's not real. And yes, Glenn Livett, 50 year is $30,000. $30,000. Yeah, I just bought a bottle. (laughs) Oh, look who's got the big wallet. Yeah, no way. (laughs) 